Well, since I mentioned that next week I start a new series, is a clean, clear indication that this morning is the end of this one. I always love the beginnings of sermon series, and I don't always like the end of them, but this concludes um, the summer we were going through the book of Matthew, and uh, King of Kings, Jesus according to Matthew. And uh, this morning it, we, we end with Matthew's last chapter, and, and it's, it's very fascinating to me because there's only 20, uh, 20, some ver- 20 verses in the last chapter of Matthew. And, and, and he, he dedicates these last 20 verses to the resurrection. And it's kind of fascinating. Why it's fascinating to me is um, it's just so short. I mean, we begin with the, 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 this idea that Jesus is king and that Matthew is a Jewish writer writing to a Jewish audience. And he's trying to establish that this man, Jesus, is the king of the Jews. He is the Messiah. And, you know, in the beginning chapters, he kind of conquers, tries to get over some hurdles to that that the Jewish audience would have had. One, Jesus was born to a guy named Joseph and ran a carpentry shop down the street. How can this guy be the Messiah? So Matthew begins with this genealogy, tracing, math, or tra- chasing Je- tracing Jesus's genealogy back to David. And then we have this whole issue of where Jesus was born. No one really knows. They just know where he came from, and he came from Nazareth. Well, Nazareth was the wrong kind of town on the wrong side of the street. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. This guy can't be the king. Matthew kind of tells us that, no, he was born in Bethlehem, like it was prophesied. And this is how he winds up in Nazareth. So, so he's constantly trying to establish that Jesus is the king. Another great thing I love about the gospel of Matthew is Matthew breaks or he chronicles the breaking of 400 years of silence. 400 years of silence from God from the end of Malachi to what we have is um, an angel appearing to Zechariah in the temple telling him that he's going to have a son. Okay? Then the next kind of silence that gets broken is an angel appears to Mary and tells her, you're going to have a son. Now, what's fascinating about both of those is he tells, he tells um, Zachariah, and Zachariah and his wife, Rebecca, are too old to have kids. You're going to have a child. And then he tells Mary, who is not too young to have a child. It's just she's not married, and she's a virgin. So how do you get this explanation? Well, the best one comes from the angel himself when, the, when Mary asks him, her, it, I don't know what an angel would be. How can this be? And the angel responds with, nothing is impossible with God. And then the prophetic silence gets broken when John the Baptist lands on the scene saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near or at hand. This prophetic silence gets broken now. And then the the physical presence of God gets broken in Matthew with the incarnation of Jesus. Think about it. God used to, God the Father used to walk with Adam and Eve in the evenings around the garden. But with sin, when sin entered, that kind of face-to-face interaction with God was severed. You have some bits and pieces throughout the Old Testament of like God showing up to Moses, Moses saying he wanted to see him. God says, you can't see me, but I'll, sh- I'll show you my back. And there, there's, there's little things like that, but there is no encounter face-to-face with God until the incarnation. So Matthew breaks all of this silence, demonstrating that Jesus is, he is the king of kings. And, and what begins Matthew with repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the last several verses of, the, of, his, of his book, the message is now, go and make disciples. Begins with the kingdom of heaven's a hand. The silence has been broken. It ends with, let's keep the silence broken. You with me? Silence is broken here. The prophetic, the personal, the tangible presence of God. Now let's keep this silence broken. It's not going to stop with Jesus' death because we get in chapter 20, we get the consummate victory of resurrection. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, These are some of the last words he'll end up sharing with them. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father 
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to, to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you even to the very end of the age. It was a couple Sundays ago I talked to you a little bit about Jesus' leadership and that Jesus led, he didn't point. That pointing is not good leadership. All right. So when he tells us to go, Jesus with his birth is the first goer. We have Jesus getting baptized, and <laughs> Jesus is the first disciple maker. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't start that by pointing. He starts that with an invitation to follow. And so he, he leads us in where he gives us authority to be, and he promises his presence in that. And these are kind of the last words in the book of Matthew. And all of that, though, kind of skips a little bit for us to go back into the chapter and look at the resurrection. Here is Matthew's account of the resurrection, just 10 verses. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. And going to the tomb, they rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Here is a continual admonition from angels that we read in Matthew. For I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you into Galilee. Again, Jesus going ahead. There you will see him. Now I, have a to now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to the, the disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. Don't be afraid. It's how the angel appears to Zechariah in the temple. Starts out, don't be afraid. When he appears to Mary, he starts out and he says, don't be afraid. When he appears to Joseph, he appears with, don't be afraid. And here, in this instance, we don't have just an angel. We have Jesus saying, don't be afraid. It's interesting to me. I think it I think what it addresses is this natural, first of all, fear of spiritual or even unknown or mystery. And then there's going to always be a fear somewhere to follow where Christ is leading. Why is that? Well, because we're all much more comfortable where we are than where we're not. And Jesus is always going to lead us to a place that's always going to seem over our heads. So staying put is, is going to be our natural human bent. And I believe that when the angel and Christ comes, the reason for the admission, admonition of don't be afraid is to say, I will be with you. I'm going ahead of you. You will come see me. Don't be, afraid. don't be afraid to stay put when I'm calling and pulling you somewhere else. It's, it's a great message of invitation. Don't be afraid. Because it's, it's not there just to, de, to, to, um, to, uh, to dispel fear. It's there to compel movement. But the fear has to be removed many times for the movement. But I would suggest you're going to live afraid most of your life doing something. Any new endeavor, any new pull, you're going to... The key isn't not to be afraid. The key is not to stay put. You with me? When fear keeps you put, stay put, that's the problem. Remember, I've said this so many times, but it's been a while maybe... The, the definition of faith is more movement than anything else. My, my movement is a better description of my faith than what I might believe, what I do. So, and it's been my experience that God shows up in the least expected places at the least expected time, but always at the right place and always at the right time because we're never, never alone in any of those places. Now, in John 1, it said, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. The message is how I usually quote this when it says, The Word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. So we've seen His glory, the glory of the one and the only, the one who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's describing the incarnation. The two greatest displays of love that we have from Christ is the incarnation and the crucifixion. 
The incarnation is the emptying of himself, coming and walking through all the stuff you and I walk through. We're told that. We're told that there's nothing that we've encountered that he hasn't encountered. And then the ne next greatest expression of love was the crucifixion. Was that even in our sin, he dies for us. Right? The resurrection is the greatest display of his power. It's the greatest display of his power. Now, why does Matthew only give even maybe 10 verses, and then there's uh, a, a few that I'll get to, and then the commission? Why, why so few if he spent all this time trying to establish that Jesus is the king? And here, here's my conclusion. My conclusion is because he spent all this time demonstrating that Jesus is the king. And the last few verses, it's kind of the drop the, drop the mic moments that, with the resurrection that said, I told you. I mean, I just think that's how it kind of plays out. Why would you only spend 10 verses talking about the consummation of history? It's because he's already been talking about it. And he gets near the end and says, period, or explanation point, you know? I mean, and then he immediately connects this to the commission, which I'll get to in a minute. So in reviewing this, I've come up with at least five. I, I have five. You might be able to come up with 50, but resurrection results, five resurrection results. These are things that the resurrection accomplished that changes the way we live this life in this kingdom for him and his kingdom. You with me? This resurrection does five different things that impacts how I live now and what's to come. All right? So here's where we'll spend the bulk of our time. The first one is the finality of death is defeated. The finality of death is defeated. So the two Marys that show up at the tomb, they had no intention of coming into a, finding a resurrected Lord. They had all intentions of finding a dead teacher. That was what they expected. That's what they were going to see. And with the encounter of the angel and with the encounter of Christ, what they realized was he was not dead. There is always going to be a pain in the process of death. Probably everybody in this room had experienced someone close to them die. There is a pain in the process of death. There's a pain in grappling with death. But what the resurrection demonstrates is death isn't the end. Death isn't the end. In fact, Paul says it this way in, um, in 2 Corinthians. He says, for we know, and this is out of the Amplified Version. So the Amplified Version adds a lot of different words to help us understand the nuances of the Greek words. It says, for we know that if the earthly tent, our physical body, which is our house, is torn down through death, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our immortal, eternal, celestial dwelling, so that by putting it on we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan being burdened, often weighed down, oppressed, not that we want to be unclothed, not that we want to be separated by death from the body, but to be clothed so that what is mortal, the body, will be swallowed up by life after the resurrection. Now he who made us and prepared us for this very purpose in God, so we've, we've been prepared for this death in this new body, okay? So we've been prepared for it. He gave us the Holy Spirit as a pledge, as a guarantee, a down payment, that this promise would be fulfilled. So then, being always filled with good courage and confident hope, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight, living our lives in a manner consistent with our confident belief in God's promises. We are, as I was saying, of good courage and confident hope, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, whether we at home, were at home on the earth or away from home and with him, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing him. To be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. That when there is a last breath for a believer in this life, there is a first breath alive in Christ in the kingdom. There, 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 is, there is no gap. There is no pause Last breath, first breath. I wanted to be with my mom and my dad during those last breaths because I wanted to be in the room, even though, look, there was no bright light, angels didn't serenade me, okay? But there was something special in the room when my father and my mother took their last breath because I knew the next breath was with the father. 
there's still tears of the goodbyes, but those are temporary because the finality of death ended with the resurrection. How does that change your life if you believe that this life is not all there is? So we, 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 in this life, if this life is all there is, then I would agree that we need to get all we can get while we're here. We need to live it up as much as possible. This is a short window, so no regrets, straight ahead, do everything I can to please myself. But if this life is not all there is, then it changes the way I live this life. Because it says, it says here at the end, it is our constant ambition to be pleasing Him. Then the pleasing Him in this life takes precedent over than just me getting everything I can now. Look, although it will look differently for each of us, we all long for this life for security, for love, and for purpose. Okay? And now it gets, it gets played out differently in all our lives of how we go about that. But when we go after those things on the very temporary, temporary promises that, that this world offers, this culture offers, we find they're always missing. They're always, there's always something missing. You know, they're, they're, they're actually, they're shortcuts. And in my, in my experience, shortcuts always overpromise and underdeliver. We, we go after shiny. Shiny always overpromises and underdelivers. Okay? And so if this life is not all there is, then I will fi- find this kind of love and security and purpose. I'll find it in the kingdom. So it changes what I go after, how I go after it here and now. That this is, in fact, scripture says that our life now is but a breath. It's but a breath. I've already breathed like six times. You didn't even notice. But eternity is, by nature, eternal. And so I've got more life ahead of me than I have right now. So what I face, how I face it, should be seen through that filter. Here's the second result. Sin has been overpowered. And that same power resides in us. Okay? Sin has over, been overpowered, and that same power resides in us. When Adam and Eve sin in the garden, there becomes this broken relationship. God institutes a sacrificial system where animals are sacrificed so that the relationship with God can be maintained. And, but the way I see that sacrificial system, this not might be completely accurate to say I'm, I'm not a... I'm not an attorney, but I would see the sacrificial system was like a temporary restraining order. The sin still had power, but it was going to be temporary, and the sacrifices kind of kept us in relationship. But when Christ died, he died once and for all. Eliminated any other need for any other sacrifice. And so the the power of sin is broken. Now, we still still have this old nature inside of us, and and, and that old nature being tamed and and eradicated is a process we call discipleship. But the power of that sin to dictate is no longer there. It'd be like an old boss of yours calling you up and telling you that why are you late this morning? You need to get your backside into the office or into the job or whatever. Wait, wait, wait. I quit you two years ago. I've moved on. That authority is no longer, could yell, could have the same voice, right? It could have the same intimidating presence. But there's no authority there. And so with, with sin being defeated on the cross, there's no more authority. Here's how Paul describes it in Colossians. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power. And authority. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when we were circumcised in Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. 
when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away and he has nailed it to the cross. So when he was nailed to the cross, he died, right? So when when this is nailed to the cross, it dies. The cross is a place of death. It's died. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I've probably preached that verse. I, I don't even know how many times in here. And, and you might get tired of the imagery. But the imagery here isn't a squeaked by victory. The imagery here is a public embarrassment of the person I've just defeated. In a military aspect, it would have been taking the king or the general or whoever led it in front of everybody and, and disrobing him. Starting with any kinds of awards or medals that would have, we, they might not have had medals, but they would have had something to display the battles won. And this person would have been totally and utterly humiliated and proven to be nothing in the sight of the winning side. Is that imagery getting to you a little bit? So when you and I wrestle with sin, we're wrestling with a defeated power that has been embarrassed by our Savior on the cross. And there might still be a pull from our old nature, but it is one that we can control by the Holy Spirit in our life because the power rests in us. And that's what Paul says in the next next verses I want to read to you in Ephesians. It says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus the Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Paul is praying for his people that you know it, you know it this much now, but I'm praying that you know it this much later. And it is incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and pointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Is it difficult to comprehend that the same power that resurrects Jesus from the dead? I mean, listen, he was stone cold dead. There there, there was no mistake. The Romans were very, very good at what they did. The executions were executed with precision. There was no doubt he's dead. He's dead on Friday. He's dead on Saturday. He's dead on Sunday right until he's not. And and that power, Paul is trying to help us grasp the power that resurrects Jesus from being dead, dead, is the same power that resides in us by the Holy Spirit. It is what raised you. If you're a follower of Christ, when you were dead, dead spiritually, made you alive in Christ, and then then, then you were just not off on our own then. It's not just pat on the backside and saying, go after him, champ. It's, it's, I have my spirit, the same spirit that's caused this aliveness to come into your dead life is the same power that you can walk this out day in and day out, day in and day out. This is the resurrection result. Death's not over. Sin doesn't have any more power. It is what happens with the resurrection. Matthew said it in 10 verses. It's going to take me about 25 minutes. Third one, resurrection result. Jesus' claim as king is validated. This this is the ultimate validation that he said who he said he was, right? Because if Jesus just stays dead, then it was just another person who had grandiose dreams. And what I would say is he talked a good game. Talked a good game, couldn't deliver. 
Um, I went to a small NAIA school, 1982. I show up at Lee College, 800 students. They had a handful of sports, men's basketball, women's basketball, men's golf, women's golf, men's tennis, women's tennis. I think that might have been the result. It. So the rest of us that landed there that were athletic, that played sports in high school, there was really nothing, nothing to achieve to. And it was amazing how many guys showed up there that, you know, would say, yeah, I had a Division I offer for this, and I had a Division I offer for that, you know. And, it's, and you're, wow, I, wow, you know, you're kind of impressed. And then, it's, then, then intramurals come around. And I know baseball is not the same as softball. I understand that. But if you can run, you can run. If you can't, you can't. If you can catch something, you can catch it. If you can't, you can't. And it was amazing how many people talked a good game, but when it came time to deliver, they were woefully inadequate. Jesus was not woefully inadequate. When it came time to put up or shut up, he put up. And it validates all of what Matthew has said so far. That he is not, he wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't just a good man. He just wasn't the son of a carpenter. He was the king, and this proves it. Fourth resurrection result is that spiritual opposition is real, but it's impotent. So here are the next five verses. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. I mean, if, if that is a weak plan. I mean, that was, that was done rushed and hurried, right? So if this report gets back to the governor, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll take care of him. We'll keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money, did as they instructed, and it says, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. This was spiritual opposition. This was opposition. It was a, but it was weak. It was anemic. First of all, Anytime you encounter opposition, spiritual opposition, is a clear indication that you're posing a threat to the enemy. Okay? So whether that is forward strides in your faith, something that you're, you're coming alongside someone else, there's no threat equals no opposition, so a threat's opposed. Now listen, it does not mean every opposition we face is spiritual. Okay? But the enemy will always try to, to leverage any opposition in your life for spiritual. All right? So, so in, you, you with me? I, I just saw a couple head nods. Satan is not hiding behind every stone and every stub toe or missed deal is not an element of spiritual, not necessarily an element of spiritual opposition. But what the enemy will want to do is take any opposition and spin it in a way which you feel defeated and discouraged. He's very good at that. We blame him for things he doesn't do, and we, we miss him for the stuff he is doing. He's very good at what he does, and he's ruthless. But Jesus, in teaching the disciples, John records this on the Last Supper. Jesus tells his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I've overcome the world. He's even being prophetic. That in, hey, in a few days, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Trouble's real. You're going to face it. But I've already overcome it. My spirit lives in you. Why, why is there opposition? So, so when there was opposition to Jesus' resurrection, you had the ruling class, the Sadducees are saying they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. That their, their whole um, um, uh, religious um, authority rests on what they taught, and what they taught was there was no resurrection of the dead. So what happens when a dead guy starts walking around to that theology? Kind of po pokes some holes in it, doesn't it? The Pharisees, on the other hand, they crucify him not believing he's the Messiah. When, when Jesus raises from the dead and there's no doubt that he's the Messiah, what does that do to their authority? Listen, God always comes in to disrupt authority, power that's set up not a part of him. Okay? And so that's why there's always going to be power and authority that's always going to be opposed to Christ because Christ is always going to upset that. 
our country, the Western culture specifically, we, we make ourselves to be gods instead of being possessed, possession, gods, big, big G, apostrophe S. All right? So, so we always want to be in control. We want to be the ones in the power. And once you acknowledge that Jesus is king, then, you, then that's a problem because then those two things can't coexist. There's even a walk away, but you can't, you can't, you got to do something with that. Spiritual opposition is real, but it's impotent. Here's the last one. Our real purpose is established and empowered. Our real purpose is established and empowered. With the inception of Gateway Church, we wanted to establish and help people become spiritually influential so that your lives have a spiritual impact on other people's lives. Okay? I mean, that, and that's the heart of anything that we want to do is that. Now, when you consider how culture works and how our own heart works, every, everybody that I've ever encountered longs, longs for something more than they are, right? They, they, they want to give you, you want to give yourself to something bigger than you are. But I've used this phrase for 13 years that we long for a purpose, but we settle for a cause. We long for a purpose, but we settle for a cause. Okay? Now, what is a cause? A cause is something temporary and something usually driven by something going on in culture or society. It's not that they're not good causes. They're great good causes. Okay? But, but causes will come and go. Purpose remains. The purpose we have is for other people to find Christ. This is why the Great Commission and the resurrection are so intimately linked here. Because he's saying, I've defeated death, hell, the grave, sin. You are alive in Christ. You have power, the same power that resurrected me. Now, take that and go do this. That's why they're connected. And that is our purpose. We all have different arenas. We have different people that mixes in with us. We have different, we're wired differently, but we all share the same purpose. And there will not be the kind of life that you're looking for outside of joining the Father in this purpose. There isn't anything better than that. And that's where he goes to, Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's called the Great Commission. Here is a definition of commission, just straight out of the dictionary. The authority to act for, in behalf of, or in place of another a task or matter entrusted to one as the agent for the other. He doesn't give us... Now, let me say this. I, I want to take a, a, a snap poll in here, and I only had about 25% participation in the first service. It's a really, really low bar, okay? How many of you would say that you're driven to do something, some things, you're, you're driven by duty? You're a duty-driven person. Raise your hand. Duty-driven, all right? Okay, that's, that's me, firstborn, only born, duty, 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 all right? Now, how many of you are driven, though, more by invitation? Then this would be the opposite. You're driven by more by invitation, someone inviting you to do something. Micah is. All right, so, well, that's probably about 30%. You beat the first service, but not by much. Now, why is that important? All my life, I've read the Great Commission as a duty-bound statement. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting he's making a suggestion. But when I read it this week, I read it as an invitation. Let me tell you why. I talk about my dad a lot. If you've been around Gateway long, you know, you, you're tired of me talking about my father. The most intimate time I've ever spent with my father was under the hood of an engine. Under the hood of a car. My dad was not an expressive man. Um, but when he, and he never even kind of let me get under the hood much, 
right? I mean, my dad, he wasn't interested in me becoming a mechanic, but he taught me enough that I would make money for the business in one bay. I'd do the stuff that could be in and out, change the oil, fix a tire, you know. But over here is where dad would do the work fixing stuff. Now, I could replace broken stuff on an engine. If it's broken, I could take it off and put something else on, but I couldn't fix anything. I couldn't tell you what necessarily was wrong and then take it apart and fix it and put it back. My dad could. And there was times he invited me over to his side of the garage, and he would say, hey, can you read? I can't get my hand down there. So I'd get my hand down there. Or, hey, I can't get this last plug out. Can, can, you get your, can you get this wrench back there? And then he would take time with me then under that hood and that engine, and it was an intimate time with my dad. Now, I was getting paid an hourly wage. I had to do what he told me to do because he was my dad and he was my boss. But I didn't go over to the car because he was my dad or he was my boss. I went over to the car because my dad invited me to be doing something he was doing. And in fact, something he loved to do. My dad loved something coming in broken, leaving fixed. And he invited me into that process. And I'm telling you, I had no more intimate conversations or interactions with my father outside of that. That was, that was like the holy grail. And so when I read this great commission, he dies for this purpose. He dies for this power. He dies and resurrects so that the silence is over. And then he invites us to do what his heart is. How can you get more intimately connected to the Father than joining him in the work he has always established to be done? I don't think you can. Our faith is not a personal, passive faith. It is an active faith joint effort with the Father, that He empowers and He's joyful. And when my dad would get excited, I'd get excited, and I didn't even know what he was excited about. But he was excited, so I was excited. When you walk through the Great Commission, it, it proves it's not passive. Aaron, come on up. The first says, go. I mean, you're not even starting with a passive word. Go. Go. It's movement. A commission is a call to movement. Then it's make. The commission is a hands-on process. I stand before you today, a hands-on project of countless, countless numbers of people. It started when I was young. It still goes on now. We, we can become a disciple, but we're always becoming a disciple. And it's always a hands-on, sometimes messy and dirty process. If you're a disciple, someone's had his hands on you too. And for us to continue to grow and move, we got to have more hands and more voices getting in more messes with us to make us disciples. The Great Commission is an active, hands-on invitation to the purpose of God and His kingdom. And He empowers every step of faith and movement in that direction. That I don't have to be afraid because I don't know what to do or I don't know how to do it. Because it's his invitation, and he says, don't be afraid. He, you, can put, you can put, don't be afraid to the Great Commission. He could have easily said, don't be afraid, go. Then he says to all nations. Jesus was a Jew. He came for the lost house of Israel. But with his death and the resurrection, the promise that, it, that God made to Abraham was fulfilled. I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And we have the doors open wide. You know, when you read Revelation 5, in Revelation 5, there are people surrounding the throne of God. And here's what it, here's what it says. That there are people there from every tribe, every tongue, every dialect, and every nation. So what this tells me is that God has crafted uniquely in every human being, in, in every um, subset of individuals, Something he, his, he so desires to have that return to him in their own language, in their own dialect, worship back to him. So why, why, why do we go to Kenya and Cambodia and Uruguay? You want to say, Pastor, that's a pretty small world. Well, that's about as much world as we can handle right now. I encourage you to talk to anybody who just got back from Kenya and ask them, well, was it worth going? You can argue all day up long, could you just raise the money and send it over, and I will tell you unequivocally, to the day I die, money doesn't change people. People change people. Now, it takes money to get people to people, 
But people change people. No doubt, did you lead worship in the women's prison? Did you lead a song or talk? Women's prison. Life imprisonment for a lot of these women. But I guarantee you, they had some church. Because even in that hopeless situation that you would consider hopeless, I'm in a lifetime in prison. They worship up a storm, didn't they, Nick? But here's something unique. Because not every, sometimes people go, I can't get there. I can't, you know, how do I fulfill that part? Listen to this. This is from worldpopulationreview.com. Nashville has become a trendy destination for immigrants due to a healthy job market and relatively low cost of living. The foreign-born population of the city tripled between 1990 and 2000, from 12,600 to 39,500. The foreign-born population has nearly doubled over the last decade and makes up about 12% of the population. The city is home to, the, to large populations of Mexicans, Kurds, Vietnamese, Cambodians, Laotians, Arabs, and Bantus. I didn't even, I didn't even recognize Bantu. I look it up. And I've been in South Africa, and apparently there are, there are segments of South Africa where there are black South Africans have been regulated, had been regulated years ago to live from the white Afrikaans. And, and, and imagine that, you didn't even know the word existed, and they live here. There are also small com com communities of Pashtuns from Pakistan and Afghanistan, mostly concentrated in Antioch. Nashville is home to the largest population of Kurdish people in the country. Kurds, whenever you hear something going on in the Middle East, it's always going to be between the Kurds and the Sunnis, all right, the Shiite. And outside of the Middle East, there is no larger population in the world of Kurds than Nashville. That blows my mind. And listen, most of the foreign-born that live among us have family and home. And when you get a taste of Jesus... You do not keep it from your family. One of the one of the coolest things that happened when Gene and I first moved here, you know, I told you we we live in the same place for 13 years in Atlanta. And, you know, uh, the church was well known and and people knew us. And but we got here, I was unprepared for being anonymous. In fact, there was no preparation in church planning I'd ever had that people said you're going to be anonymous and it's not going to be nice. It's not going to be good for a while. Now, when I, when I talk to church planners, I help them with that. But we remember the first time, don't you, hon? We're walking in the Publix. Was it the Publix at Kroger? In Spring Hill. She's trying to tell me I can't hear her, so just believe what I say. Huh? All right, there was no Publix. That's right. And someone called us by name. I mean, we were ready to stop and build an altar. We're known. When you choose to engage someone... It's by themselves, or stuck in a corner, or their head down. You have now just removed them from the position of anonymous and overlooked. Game changer. Game changer. I try to call everybody by name. And I see anybody with a name tag on, it freaks them out. They don't even know how I know their name. Because they forgot they got a name tag on. This is a part of go, going, going happens even here if we have eyes to see and a heart to engage. And then he ends, and lo, I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Tells the disciples, tells the ladies, go tell my brothers, I'll meet them in Galilee. He was already going to be in Galilee when they got there. He's not a pointer. He's a leader. And so, listen, it, it, it sometimes it's, it's hard to overcome your fear to engage people, okay? But, but what the resurrection teaches us, and with this commission, is that God's already there. So shouldn't that change our fear level when we go to engage someone? If we understand that he's already there. That, in fact, I'm not broaching a new conversation with someone. The Holy Spirit cares more about them than I do. The Holy Spirit's already at work. Scripture says the fields are whitened to harvest, which means there's nothing wrong with the harvest. 
I don't have to look at anybody that something's wrong with them. They're ready. They're ready to be engaged. Changes my whole outlook. Changes my whole outlook of how I engage people. I have the power in Christ that rests inside of me based on His Holy Spirit. I can follow His direction. He's already beat me there, waiting for me to show up. So I'm going to show up. And He'll take care of the rest. The resurrection changes everything, folks. It's not just a little story. And the reason why I believe that Matthew only spends 10 verses on it because he's already, he spent his whole book proving his point. That we live in this kingdom, but we belong to his kingdom. And when these kingdoms come together, there's a clash. And I will always have a choice. But he empowers my choice when I choose his kingdom. Our goal of being a disciple is getting rhythm with the kingdom. Getting rhythm with the kingdom. So what do you do with this message? What do you do with the series? I ask myself this. You probably don't ask yourself this, but I ask myself this. I have become even more intimately connected with Christ through studying Matthew and through preaching through King of Kings. And I hope you have as well. He is your King. But He's not just your King. Because you are royalty too. He gives us our inheritance. We have a kingly inheritance. We're chosen people. We're royal. That changes the way I live too. So Father, for all the minds and hearts in the room today, Lord, I just pray that we approach life in light of eternity, not in light of this next hurdle or next struggle or even next achievement. We desire our hearts to be placed in rhythm with you and, Lord, that you would lead us to the nations, the nations that have taken up residence among us, the nations to which you will actually send us to place our feet and hands in making disciples. You are the first goer. You are the first disciple maker. And you've asked us to follow you. And Lord, we choose to do that today. In closing, if you, if you want to know an easy on-ramp to the Great Commission, I had no, no easier on-ramp than praying this simple prayer. Lord, put someone in my path today that I can share your kingdom. It is the simplest of on-ramps there is to the Great Commission because if you will sincerely pray that prayer, then you are going to be faced with a person that you will step in and engage. Hands down, it's an invitation of our Father to be intimately engaged with Him in relationship and in His purpose. And there is no greater joy, hands down, there is no greater joy than making disciples no greater joy. You were created to be one. You were created to make one. Duty, I'm not suggesting it's just a suggestion, but boy, when you look at it as an invitation for joy with the Father, that's a game changer for me. It's a game changer for me. And so Father, again, I know I'm praying again, but Lord, I just pray that you would stick it in all of our hearts. Lord, to say tomorrow, Monday, Lord, put someone in our path that we can influence and engage for your kingdom. Amen. Stand for the benediction. If you're a guest with us today, it's great having you part of our worship service. It's always a joy to meet new people. I hope you get a chance to meet some new people and hopefully even stop by the Connect Center. We have a gift for you if you're a guest. The benediction is, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face, to sh his face to shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. You're rising up, you're laying down, you're going out and coming in both now and forevermore. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.